Good evening. Welcome to the Atlanta History Center. I'm Sal Salella, President and CEO of the History Center. This is a, another Livingston Lecture, which is made possible through the generous support of the Livingston Foundation of Atlanta. And we are ever so grateful uh, to them for their continued support. Our next Livingston Lecture will be held May 16th and will feature James B. Stewart, author of Tangled Webs, How False Statements Are Undermining America, from Martha Stewart to Bernie Madoff. I've seen some of the previews of this book, and you would be well advised to, to be here. It's, it's fascinating. Also in May, join us for a lecture featuring the best-selling author of Devil in the White City, Eric Larson, who will be here. He'll be discussing his new book, in the Garden of Beasts, Love, Terror, and an American Family in Hitler's Berlin. Tonight's lecture is being recorded by C-SPAN, and check your local listings for the broadcast date. You can see it again. At this time, I'd like to ask you to please turn off all your cell phones or pagers, any other electronic devices that might disrupt our program, or as the uh, Delta Airline flight attendant said, turn off everything that doesn't keep you alive. <laughs> Those Delta Airline stewardesses are cheeky. Our author this evening is David Nichols, who will speak for about 40 minutes and then he'll take your questions. David Nichols is a leading expert on the Eisenhower presidency. This evening he'll discuss his new book, Eisenhower 1956, The President's Year of Crisis, Suez and the Brink of War, which the Christian Science Monitor called one of seven history books worth checking out in 2011. He's the author of A Matter of Justice, Eisenhower and the Beginning of the Civil Rights Revolution, and Lincoln and the Indians. He holds a PhD from William and Mary, and he currently resides in Kansas. Please join me in welcoming David Nichols to our stage. Thank you, Sal. <clears throat> and it is an honor to be here and to be with people who love history. Uh, that's always the best audience one can ever have, and I'm grateful for being here. First, uh, we need to shoot down the nasty rumor that's been going around that my publisher, Simon & Schuster, stirred up all the trouble in the Middle East just to sell my book. That's not true. Not true. Uh, this is also a day when the news is telling us that once again an author at least allegedly, has been making up stuff. And I want you to know that this book, accepting some commentary in the conclusion, that in this book, not a phrase is in it that is not rooted in a document or in compelling circumstantial evidence. Eisenhower, 1956, is a new story in so many respects because it's based on hundreds of top secret documents that have been de de declassified since the last major book on the Suez Crisis was published 30 years ago. And when I get done with the presentation, those of you who have not read the book, and I assume most of you have not, will kind of think you know the story, but please read the book because the book is better than the speech. I guarantee that. <laughs> I know the book. And it is above all a deeply personal story about the man we call affectionately Ike, and a word about this complex man. Eisenhower was a military man, but he was not militaristic. That is, he did not think that war was often a solution to anything. He was, one aide recalled, slow to pick up the sword. Ike's public persona, that grandfatherly man with a big smile and a love of golf, was largely Ike's personal invention. Behind the scenes, he was strategically rigorous and a tough-minded commander-in-chief. The people who worked for him never doubted who was in charge. Eisenhower was a citizen of the world more than any other president, yet he never forgot where he came from. That's why his presidential library is in Abilene, Kansas, close to where I live. Ike was not a professional politician, yet he was one of the most successful politicians in our history and supremely protective of his hero's image. I did not hesitate to use subordinates like Secretary of State John Foster Dulles as lightning rods for controversial policies that were, in fact, Ike's creation. Eisenhower had a volatile temper, a temper that exploded like a rocket. But at tense moments requiring great decisions, he was unfailingly cool, calm, and deliberate. 
This was a profoundly religious man who had prayer at the beginning of cabinet meetings. Yet when that famous temper erupted, he could turn the air blue with soldierly profanity and did so frequently. Above all, Eisenhower saw himself not as a warrior, but as a peacemaker, and that's what this book is about. And today, tonight, at a time of war and unrest in the Middle East, it's fitting that we review together the most dangerous international crisis of the Eisenhower presidency. That crisis was also in the Middle East. This is a tale of nail-biting dramas. Drama number one begins on September 23, 1955 in Denver, Colorado on the golf course. Dwight Eisenhower had not enjoyed a vacation so much in years. <clears throat> Believe it or not, the President of the United States had himself cooked a huge breakfast that morning for his fishing buddies. But golf was the President's priority for the day. After a briefing at his Lowry Air Force Base office, Eisenhower headed for the Cherry Hills Country Club. Ann Whitman, Ike's secretary, remembered that she had never seen him look or act better. Eisenhower's golf game was interrupted four times that day for phone calls from the Secretary of State, John Foster Dulles. Now, this was before cell phones, so an irritated and probably profane Ike had to return to the clubhouse for each call, only one of which actually got through. That call was important. Dulles confirmed to Eisenhower that the Soviet Union had made an arms deal with Egypt. Ike knew that this bold move would open a new chapter in the Cold War, and Ike and Dulles agreed that the president should send a message to Soviet Premier Nikolai Bolganin. But the president wanted to think about it overnight. He told Dulles he would call him the following morning. That phone call was never made. Ike went back to golf but his game deteriorated. As the day wore on, the president experienced a growing discomfort. He declined his usual evening drink, had little appetite for dinner, and retired early. And in the middle of the night, Ike appeared by Mamie's bedside. I've got a pain across the lower part of my chest, he said. Since he had complained earlier about indigestion, Mamie gave her husband milk of magnesia. At 2.54 a.m., Mamie called Dr. Howard Snyder, the president's physician, who rushed to the White House. Snyder initially put out the word that this was a digestive upset when he knew it was a massive heart attack. He waited until mid-afternoon that day before transporting the president to Fitzsimmons Army Hospital, and even then had Ike walk to his car instead of calling an ambulance. Now, if you want more detail on the mismanagement of this situation, you got to read the book. <laughs> I don't have time tonight. Eisenhower was in the hospital for six weeks. And in those days, the gold standard for treatment of heart attack patients was total bed rest. Ike's doctors would not permit him to read a newspaper, watch a movie, listen to a football game on the radio, let alone do much serious presidential business. He did not take a step across his room for a month, and this incredibly active man felt like a caged animal. So at the very moment the Soviet Union attempted to change the balance of power in the Middle East, Eisenhower was out of commission, and Secretary of State John Foster Dulles was on his own, unable to consult with the President as he normally did. And let us bury once and for all the myth that John Foster Dulles ran American foreign policy in the Eisenhower years. Everyone close to both men, and I've talked with a number of them, knew that Ike was in charge. Dwight Eisenhower was out of the White House. People hardly believe this. Dwight Eisenhower was out of the White House for three and a half months, excepting two nights on his way to recuperate in Gettysburg. Drama number two is the one that the heart patient so restricted in his other activities obsessed about, that is, whether he should run for a second term in 1956. I'm satisfied that Ike always intended to run. In the age of Roosevelt, you had to have a second term to be a great president, and Ike wanted to be a great president. But the heart attack raised the enormous question of whether physically he could run. Ike repeatedly discussed possible successors with aides. 
none of whom had a snowball's chance in hell of getting nominated, let alone elected.